Is the world overpopulated? I'm Daniel Mushala, and this is The Scholar's Mate. Welcome to The Scholar's Mate. I'm your host, Dan Mushala. Joining us today are Steve Mosier of the Population Research Institute and Robert Walker of the Population Institute. As of this broadcast, the world's population stands at 7.1 billion people. The growing numbers of people on the planet have been blamed for many of the world's environmental problems, not to mention poverty, hunger, disease, and other causes of human suffering. But Steve Mosier, you object to these arguments and say that the world is in fact not overpopulated. Can you explain? Well, I think I can. And, and I'd like to tell Bob that, that you could take the entire population of the world and fit it in the state of Texas and give everybody a single family dwelling with a front and backyard. And the rest of the world would be empty. And that's just a way of illustrating that the world is still a pretty empty place. There are lots of wide open spaces uh, on the continents. And, you know, we talk about there being 7 billion people, 7.1 billion people. But in fact, human lifespans have never been longer. Uh, educational standards have never been higher. Per capita income has never been higher. People have never eaten better. They've never lived better lives. They've never had more opportunity for entertainment, for information, for education than, than ever before. And that is in large part due to our increasing numbers. And, and let's go back in history now to about 1800. In 1800, we had about a billion people on the planet and the per capita income was $100 per head worldwide, which is not very much. By 1927, we had two billion people. So we doubled the number of people on the planet but per capita income had gone up five times. So as our numbers doubled, our average standard of living went up much, much faster. By 1960, we reached three billion, which is another 50% increase. But again, our per capita income had tripled to $1,500. By 2000, we'd reached six billion. Per capita income was $5,000 for every man, woman, and child on the planet. And so if you look at population increasing, you see that our living standards have increased faster and faster than population growth. So as our numbers have increased, so has our economic well-being. So we haven't hit uh, any kind of a ceiling. I don't think we're going to hit a ceiling in terms of population growth. In fact, the, the big picture now is that 70% of the world's population is not reproducing itself. 70% of the world's population is having too few children to maintain the current population of the countries they live in. So that the segment of the population that's actually having more than 2.1 children is shrinking. The segment of the world's population that's having fewer than 2.1 children is, is growing. And over time, we're going to hit a peak. I don't know exactly when we're going to hit the peak or what the numbers will be. It may be 9 billion, maybe a little more, maybe a little less. But after that peak, it's fairly clear that our numbers are going to begin to decline after mid-century, later in this century. And that means that our long-term problem is not going to be too many people. Our long-term problem is going to be the problem we see today in Germany, in Italy, in Spain, in Japan, in Taiwan, in South Korea. I could go on to name dozens of countries where they have too few young people coming into the workforce. They have an aging population. They have a situation where they're filling more coffins each year than cradles. We have dying countries. Japan is dying. South Korea is dying. Most of the European countries are going to be losing population in the years to come if they aren't already. So our long-term problem is not overpopulation. It is, it is depopulation. And it's going to be devastating for the economies. Your thoughts, Bob? Daniel, if we lived on a planet with 
infinite space and infinite resources, we wouldn't be having this debate tonight. Um, the sad, really inescapable truth is uh, that we live on a finite planet with limited amounts of fresh water, of topsoil, of forest, of arable land, of metals, minerals, and even fossil fuels. Uh, and we live on a planet with a limited capacity for absorbing carbon dioxide, toxic chemicals, and other forms of pollution. Modern humans, I'll give you a few other population numbers, modern humans have been on the planet for over 200,000 years. For most of that time, we have lived in almost perfect harmony with the planet. Um, but beginning about 10,000 years ago, uh, with the introduction of agriculture and livestock, we began slowly to transform this planet. Uh, we began by cutting down trees and damming rivers and drilling for wells. 200 years ago, with the advent of the Industrial Revolution, that transformation that began 10,000 years ago went into overdrive. You just went through the population numbers. We went from 1 billion, you said, in I think it was 1800, 1800 correct? Roughly. To today, it's actually 7.2 billion. Okay. Population keeps growing. And if birth rates were to remain unchanged, if they were just frozen in place today, world population would grow to 27 billion by the end of the century. Now, demographers will tell you that fertility rates are likely to continue to decline, and that's true. But the consensus forecast today amongst demographers is that we will not see, as previously hoped or previously thought, population reaching a peak around mid-century. Indeed, the latest forecast suggests that population will continue to grow right through the end of the century. And that assumes very significant declines in fertility yet to come. Now, it's true that we could easily put 7.2 billion people into the state of Texas. I will not dispute that. We could put them into a lot smaller space than that, as you well know. But the question is not about how many people can the earth contain. It's a question about how many people the earth can sustain, at what standard of living, and for how long. Daniel, Steve, there is plenty of evidence to suggest that humanity is already exceeding planetary limits and that we are reducing the Earth's capacity to support life, including human life. The warning signs are all around us. Let me just go through a few of those warning signs. We are rapidly increasing the concentration of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. We are polluting and acidifying, changing the very chemistry of the oceans. We are destroying coral reefs and overfishing the great ocean fisheries. Indeed, the population of tuna and marlin and other large fish has gone down by 90% in the last 50 years. We have literally taken over this planet. Right now, just to grow our crops, we require an agricultural area the size of South America to do that. And for grazing of livestock, the animals that we grow, to, that we eat. We require an area the size of Africa. That's a lot of land that we have taken simply for ourselves. We are almost on the verge of becoming a one species planet. There is no such thing as a one species planet, but we're well on our way to becoming one. And the reason why I say that is because we are extinguishing plant and animal species at a rate that is about 1,000 times the natural, normal, historical rate of extinction. Leading biologists are now warning that we have created what's called the sixth mass extinction in the history of this planet. The fifth mass extinction was 68 million years ago when the dinosaurs got wiped out by the asteroid or the comet or whatever it was. And now we find that we're also using our renewable resources, topsoil, water, and other renewable resources at an unsustainable rate. Scientists are warning that by 2030, we are going to require two planets, two Earths, to support us for the long run. Well, I think you and I both know we only have one planet. Water scarcity is reaching crisis proportions in many parts of the world, including right here in the United States, in California, where there's an emergency drought, and in the Southwest, 
and many of those states will not be able to support their current populations if those droughts continue. We see around the world that major rivers are no longer flowing to the ocean, like the Colorado River. We see lakes like the Aral Sea are shrinking. The global demand for water is expected to rise by 40% in the next 20 years. Are we going to have enough water? No. The scientists tell us that we will need the equivalent of 20 Nile rivers to meet our demand for fresh water in the next 20 years. But we don't have those 20 Nile rivers to call upon. And in fact, that's why they say that the available water supply will satisfy only about 60% of our demand. So what I'm saying is, is that there are plenty of danger signs out there right now. Yes, we did very well in the 20th century. It was a great success mm -hmm. story, population-wise and everything else. Absolutely. Everything you said about the 20th century is correct. But you know they have a saying on Wall Street, past performance is no guarantee of future results. What was true in the 20th century may not be true in the 21st century. Steve? Well, what you basically admitted, Bob, is that all the evidence is of, of past success is on my side, and all the projections of scary stories and, and hyperbole about future disaster are just possibilities that can be averted. And, and how can we avert any catastrophes? We avert them because we have every stomach comes with two hands attached, every mouth is backed by a creative intelligence. So human beings have the ability to react to the problems that they, their numbers cause and check those problems and correct those problems. We had, in this country 30 years ago, we had far more pollution, air pollution in Southern California where I used to live than we do now. Why? Because we cleaned up the automobile exhaust and the other sources of air pollution. There's still a problem, but we're working on it. We had Lake Erie dead, unable to support even uh, the smallest of fish. Now it's a thriving fishery again. Why? Because we've cleaned it up, we've prevented the pollutants from running into it. You talk about the, the large mammals uh, in the ocean being overfished. They are being overfished. Right. And let me tell you that I went through a PhD program in oceanography years ago. I have a great love for whales and dolphins and, mm -hmm. and other cetaceans. And the reason that whale species are facing extinction is because the Japanese are consistently overfishing the whale populations because the Japanese, almost alone among the people of the earth, love their whale meat and love their blubber. Mm -hmm. Now we have international covenants on the taking of whales. You can't take them during the breeding season. You can't take them in the breeding grounds. You can't take juveniles. You can't take them during the mating season. Those international covenants which Japan has signed are being widely violated by Japanese fishermen, again, because of the demand for whale meat in Japan. Now, now I wouldn't suggest, and I, I, I dare say that you probably wouldn't suggest, that we solve the problem of the overfishing of the whales by reducing the number of Japanese. Now, if we reduce, reduce the number of Japanese babies, obviously we would reduce over time the demand for whale meat. But that's not what we should do. Population control is always a bad idea. What we should do is we should insist that the Japanese government enforce the international covenants that they have signed on their own fishermen. You see, there are always intermediate solutions that do not involve reducing the human population to solve these problems. You want more trees, you plant more trees. You don't reduce the number of babies born in Africa. Uh, you want more fish, you, you reduce the Japanese overfishing. You don't reduce the number of babies born in Japan. Now, there are challenges that are caused by our growing population. But in fact, population growth has been the greatest driver of economic growth in history. It's population growth that forced our ancestors to move from being hunter-gatherers to being uh, nomadic uh, herdsmen and to, be, to pra practicing settled agriculture. They had to because their numbers grew and they needed to produce more food on the land. And then as their numbers grew further, they begin to practice irrigation and dig irrigation canals, very labor-intensive work uh, in the Nile River Delta in China on the North Chinese Plain. And as our numbers grew, our numbers drove economic progress as we had to provide for more and more of our number. But the overall picture, to come back to the point that I made at the beginning, is that humanity is better off now than ever before. If we were running into these resource shortages that you talk about, if we were polluting ourselves off the planet, you would expect lifespans to be shrinking. They're not. They virtually doubled since World War II. 
you would expect per capita food consumption to be going down. In fact, it keeps going up. And do you know that the worst famines in human history have not been caused by overpopulation? They've been caused by government mismanagement of the economy. There's enough food produced on the planet to feed 12 billion people right now. That's not my, that's not my estimate. That's the estimate of the Food and Agriculture Organization. We're not going to reach 12 billion people. Bob? Well, I'm delighted uh, that we're now talking about the challenges we face, because that's what, really what concerns me. You mentioned that, that we are ignoring the intermediate uh, solutions, I think, the way you talked about. You've used the example, for example, of regulations on whales. I'm all in favor of enforcing the regulations on whaling. Mm -hmm. I'm all in favor of all those intermediate solutions that you think are going to save us. But let's take a closer look at some of the challenges that we face, because that's what you raise, and I think that's the critical question. Over the past decade, food production has not kept up with the world's growing appetite for food. We've, in fact, seen a steady shrinkage of global food reserves. The prices of basic food commodities, grains, vegetables, and other basic foodstuffs has doubled in the last eight years. Now, scientists also tell us at the University of Minnesota that because of both population and changing diets, that the demand for food is going to increase by 50 percent, or excuse me, it will double rather, in the next uh, 40 years. Double. Now, you say, well, we, we did it in the 20th century, so we're off. We're fine, right? Well, right now what farmers have to face is the fact that if they're going to have to double their food production, they have to do so in the, in the face of climate change, which means intensified drought, catastrophic flooding, warmer temperatures, rising seas, also increasing shortages of arable land and the increasing cost of fuel and fer fertilizer. I'm concerned about our food situation. But it's not just our food situation. Let's take a look at other challenges. Yes, the 20th century was a great success story. During the 20th century, commodity prices for metals and minerals declined in real dollar terms, seeming to verify exactly what you're saying. The problem is that over the last 14 years, everything's been reversed. Everything's been reversed. The price of metals has gone up by 176% in the last 13 years. The price of rubber went up by 350%. The price of a lot of basic commodities have gone up. The price of energy, not just oil, but price of energy generally have gone up by about 260%. Those numbers just came out this week. 15 years ago, the price of oil was $12 a barrel. Today, it's about $90 a barrel. So. And think about it. What are we doing in pursuit of all, all these riches and resources? We have leveled entire mountains. We have deforested entire countries. In order to satisfy our demand for timber and for palm oil and rubber, not just whaling, we are destroying tropical forests. The demand for ivory is destroying elephants and rhinos. The demand for even something like shark fin soup is leading to the extinction of sharks. And most importantly, though, most dramatically of all, our insatiable demand for energy. We are altering the climate of this planet. And we're even altering the very chemistry of the ocean. You know, I like to think that God may have given us dominion over the earth. But I don't think God gave us license to plunder it. He gave us the order, perhaps, to be fruitful and multiply. But I don't think he expected us to destroy his creation or other living creatures on this planet. I think the growth in human numbers, and it's not just the growth in human numbers, it's also the growth in consumption, is imperiling people, posterity, and the planet. The dangers, I think, are manifest, and I think we ignore them in our peril. I'd like to remind our audience that you can submit your questions to our guest through our website, www.publicsquare.net, and we'll answer as many as we can live on the air towards the end of the show. Okay, now, you gentlemen... Do I, I get to respond to that? I'll bring you back. Well, go okay. ahead. Just, do it. Just go ahead. Just go ahead. I'll give you a couple of minutes on that. <laughs> All right. Uh, as I mentioned, I, w I was an oceanographer briefly before the Navy sent me out to sea. And the last time I checked, the planet is covered with water. 70% uh, of the planet's surface is water, uh, which is uh, at an average depth of 6,000 feet, okay, if you average the depth of the ocean. So there's no shortage of water on planet Earth. No That's why we call it a blue planet. 
salt and water. And we now have the technology to take salt water and transform it into fresh water. At what price? And we're going to be building uh, desalination plants. Uh, we already see those in the Middle East. We, we will see those in other countries in the future as our water needs grow. So there's no global shortage of water. There are technical solutions available to solve that problem. And I believe the Earth is a cornucopia of resources that can be unlocked with our creative intelligence. Mm -hmm. And the more minds you have at work, the more creative intelligences you have at work, the more geniuses you have applying themselves to these problems, the more solutions and better solutions you will come up with. I have a farm in the Shenandoah Valley. I raise uh, almonds, at least I hope I'm still raising almonds because they've cut off the water supply to my almond orchard because of a, an environmental protection agency decision to divert all of the water to the San Joaquin Delta to keep the Delta smelt, which is a little fish about two inches long, which has no commercial value alive. So all of that fresh water is running out to the sea. A hundred thousand Farm workers are now out of work and, and on welfare because there's no work for them on the farms because the land is too dry. That is a government, uh, that is the government interfering with the production of food and artificially raising food prices. If you stop drilling for oil, if you stop looking for new resources, as we have done over the last few years, naturally the price of existing resources is going to go up as surely as day follows night. But this is an artificial constraint. We've got enough coal buried in the ground in this country. We are the Saudi Arabia of coal to feed our energy needs for the next few hundred years. Now you will say you can't burn coal because it releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. But my son last year did a science project and he grew corn in a carbon dioxide enriched environment and compared the corn to the corn grown in the non-carbon dioxide enriched environment, which is to say the open air and the corn in the carbon dioxide enriched environment grew faster and produced bigger ears. Why? Because CO2 is a trace element on which all life depends and the more CO2 you have in the atmosphere the faster plants grow. And of course as plants grow they take CO2 out of the atmosphere as do the oceans and it reduces the amount of CO2 and, and you have balance again. If we do have warming and I think the jury is still out on that we will open up vast tracts of land in Canada and in Siberia in northern Asia which cannot currently be farmed because the the growing season is too short we will open them up to cultivation and and that will increase food production even further so I don't think that warming uh, a degree or two or increasing the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere by a few percentage points is going to to do anything but help us over the long run. I did a historical climate study of China. Did you know that 2,000 years ago in China you could grow rice? It was warm enough that you could grow rice along the Yellow River, the Huanghe in northern China. You can't do that today because it's too cold. The Chinese love their rice and they'd love to be able to grow rice up there again. Uh, and they will be able to do that if the climate warms a little bit. I think first of all, let me just say one quick thing because I know we're running no, short no, of time. Please. But I could have saved your son the science project because no one is suggesting that carbon dioxide is going to kill off corn. No, no one's ever suggesting that. What people are suggesting is that higher temperatures, particularly high temperatures in the middle of the summer, could prevent uh, corn from pollinating and that could result in catastrophic loss of corn crops. We've seen those kind of catastrophic loss of corn crops in the United States. We've seen them in other parts of the world. When temperatures rise as a result of climate change, we see very significant things. You may be very optimistic about the fact that climate change, if it happens, and it is happening, will benefit agriculture, but the vast weight of science says that no, in fact, we're going to see reductions of somewhere between 15 and 20 percent in agricultural yields as a result of climate change. I'm afraid that we ought to really stick to the science here and stick to the, to the evidence that is being presented to us. And I think when you look at that, it's very, very frightening what we are, we are facing. The problem with the myth of overpopulation is that it is not a harmless fantasy. It is a myth that kills. And it has killed from the beginning. When, when Thomas Malthus first came up with it, the British East India Company seized on the idea of overpopulation to, to argue that they should not provide food aid 
to starving Indians because there were too many Indians in India and they were simply going to starve to death anyway next year if they received emergency food aid this year. It caused deaths again in, in Ireland a few decades later with the potato famine when a, a disciple, actually a former student of Thomas Malthus, was the governor of Ireland and decided against providing food aid to the starving Irish because they were obviously breeding themselves off the land and providing them with food would only allow them to keep having children and they would starve to death anyway in 10 or 20 years. The myth of overpopulation has caused the Chinese government to embark on its one-child policy in 1980 when I was in China. When I was in China, I saw women arrested, charged with the crime of being pregnant. I saw women hauled off, taken by force, locked up in commune dormitories, and told they would not be released until they agreed to sterilization and abor abortion. I saw women who were seven, eight, and nine months pregnant, forcibly aborted. I saw babies killed at birth. I saw women forcibly sterilized. Now, these are the kinds of things that happen when you convince a government, uh, especially a one-party dictatorship like China, that there are too many Chinese and the country would be better off with fewer. The Chinese government now brags that it has eliminated 400 million people from the Chinese population. And you have to ask yourself, they've eliminated 400 million people of the most productive, they've eliminated 400 million of the most productive, enterprising, hardworking, entrepreneurially minded people in the world and they think they're better off? They've eliminated 400 million of the ultimate resource, the one resource you cannot do without, uh, the human mind, the human person. Uh, and they're not alone. We have documented uh, forced abortions, forced sterilizations, population control abuses, human rights abuses in 44 different countries, all driven by the idea that there are too many people and that those countries, those governments would be better off if they somehow reduce the number of babies born. Bob? I think we can take coercion off the table here. And the reason why I say that is because I think both you and I agree, I hope that we agree, that when it comes to childbearing, coercion in any form is wrong. Wouldn't you agree? Well, that was the whole point of my, what, what I just said. But, so you it, agree but the that coercion, coercion is driven, driven, form but is driven by the idea there are too many people. Well, what I'm saying is, is that First of all, let's, let's take a look at the example of China. China has reduced its population significantly under one child policy, and I believe that is a violation of human rights. So let's mm -hmm. take that off the table. When you look at what its neighbors have done, where birth rates, in fact, are comparable or even lower than China's, those birth rates were lowered without any coercion. Mm -hmm. We're not discussing coercion here. That's not the question. I think the question before us tonight is the question about whether the world is overpopulated. So let's go back to looking at those issues again, because I think that is really the challenge. The question is, are there warning signs, are there danger signs out there that would suggest that despite all the great successes we may have had in the 20th century, that the story might be different in the 21st century, that we may in fact be approaching planetary limits? And I think the answer again is overwhelming. Scientists just this week have suggested that we have taken about 60% of the ecosystem services that support life on this planet and have seriously degraded them. 60% of the ecosystem services have been seriously degraded. Now, you say for example, well, we can produce more food. And I absolutely agree that we can produce more food. The problem is we face a whole set of global challenges, most of them related to population. And yes, we could take one or more of those and solve them individually in an isolated case. But we don't solve problems in isolation. We have to take a look, as you said earlier, at the big picture. So let's take a look at that big picture. If, so, if the agronomists and the scientists are correct, that we are, because of both population and changing diets, going to have to double food production here in the next 40 years, despite all the barriers that those farmers are going to face. The question then is, well, OK, what will it take to do that? Well, the answer is that we're going to have to consume a lot more energy, that we're going to have to increase carbon emissions. Agriculture already accounts for about 20% of carbon emissions. We're going to have to deplete water supplies. Water supplies are already scarce in many parts of the world. We're going to have to erode more topsoil. And we're going to have to drill, uh, excuse me, chop down more forest. So we could, yeah, we could solve that agricultural challenge, but we only by aggravating all the others. We could solve our energy problem by, as you suggested, going in and simply taking out more of the coal and burning that. But what does that do to climate change? 
There are lots of global problems out here. The problem is that we have a whole set of them. Population relates to almost all of them. And if we are to have any chance of addressing those set of global problems in their entirety, we're going to have to reduce ultimately human numbers. And despite what you said earlier, the demographers are almost agreed across the board that fertility rates are not going down as fast as previously projected, that population will continue to grow throughout the remainder of this century. I think we face very significant challenge. And, and I think the most significant challenge of all is food. And I want to go back to food again. OK, even if we were to double food production in the next 40 years, that's not the critical question. The critical question is, will it, that food that is produced be affordable? Yes, we can take desalinization, as you said, for example. And yeah, we can desalinate water. But at what cost? If we're growing our crops with desalinated water, you better be assured that the cost of that food is going to skyrocket. Right now, we have 2.5 billion people on the planet who are living on less than $2 a day. We have about a billion people living on $1 a day or less. When the price of basic food commodities like rice, like weed, or vegetable oil, or other basic commodities, when they double as they did during the recent food crisis that we had, there's rioting in the streets. And the reason why is because the urban poor already spend about 65, 70% of their incomes on food. If you double the food prices again, which could easily happen here in the next 25 or 30 years, if you double the price of food, no matter how much food you produce, we'll find large numbers of people around the world not able to buy their food, not able to feed their families. That's one of the many, just one of the many challenges that we face globally. Okay, at this time, you gentlemen have the option, or you can, if you will, ask each other question. I, I well, I'm I'm pretty clear on 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 what Bob believes, <laughs> and and my general my general problem though with mm -hmm. with these kinds of arguments is this, that that you admit that things have gone fairly well in the past because as problems have arisen, we've been able to address them and solve them, but you're predicting disaster in the future. And, and you're predicting disaster on multiple fronts. You're saying this might happen, that might happen. But what the consequences of, of, of speculation um, of this kind have been that for the last 50 years, the United States and the United Nations have been in the business of using their uh, diplomatic arm twisting ability, of using foreign aid, of using uh, all, all measure of pressure on developing countries and their governments to get them to put them into the business of population control and and you know you say let's let's agree that coercion is bad and and I think you do uh, are sincerely troubled by the I idea that there should be forced abortions and forced sterilizations I, after all I believe but that I'm also couples troubled have a when women are forced to have a pregnancy against their own will. Well, well we're, we're all we're women, not, don't you? Can we not, agree that not, all women not, should be able to decide freely we, we are when talking, and how many children they're going to have? Talking, Isn't that a basic right? Can't we agree that they should be able about. to decide that freely? That my and be point able to is do that? that couples have the right to decide for themselves the number and spacing of their children. Hmm. And then you have USAID on the basis of the 1972 population law going into countries like Kenya and saying you need to put a, a population policy in place. And the Kenyan government originally said, well, we don't need a population policy. Our country is the size of Texas. We have far fewer people than Texas has. And we said, no, you don't understand. You have to have a population policy in place because if you don't put a population policy in place, we won't give you any foreign aid. And by the way, you won't get loans from the World Bank. You won't get short-term loans from the International Monetary Fund. You won't get help from the UN Development Agency. So we did all this arm twisting, used our foreign aid as a blunt instrument, and convinced the Kenyan government that they needed a population program. And once they said, OK, we admit we have a population program, because, of course, they knew they needed the foreign aid, we then say, fine, now that you've admitted you have a population problem, let us tell you what your population uh, policy ought to be. And so we designed for Kenya a population policy where the Kenyan government, serving as our mouthpiece, told the Kenyan people that the family size, the ideal family size, was 2.5 children. Now, 2.5 children, by the way, would be just about replacement in Kenya because 
infant and child mortality rates are still fairly high. So it's two children in the de developed world to reach zero population growth, maybe a little more. But it's about 2.5 in Africa because of, of higher mortality rates. So we now have the Kenyan government doing exactly what you say they shouldn't do, declaring to the Kenyan people that the ideal family size is two and a half children and putting in place policies to ensure that the Kenyan people followed and obeyed that mandate. And that's happened again and again and again around the world, violating the natural right of couples to decide for themselves the number and spacing of their children. That's the logical consequence, and, and you've got to see it, the logical consequence of saying there is a population problem and using your foreign aid to, to try to convince governments to intervene in the reproductive process is that you get human rights abuses and you get them in country after country. You get women in Indonesia led off at gunpoint by the Indonesian military for their sterilizations. You get the Tamil in Sri Lanka, uh, Tamil women forcibly sterilized by the majority Sri Lankans because they think the Tamils have too many children. You get what we talked about in China, you get Vietnam's two-child policy where after two children you have to go in for sterilization. This is a logical consequence. It no, all follows the consequence. It the all follows from the overpopulation this. from the overpopulation thesis, no. you see. First of all, our policy, our government's policy with respect to family planning is rights based. We believe our government believes, and the USAID believes, that women should be able to decide freely how many children they're going to have and when. And that in order to do that, they require access to modern methods of contraception. And that efforts to deny them, do you support, by the way, international family planning assistance, contraception? We spend, we spend a billion dollars a year shipping Depro-Provera and IUDs and condoms and, and, and other birth control means over to foreign countries. Do you support that? And what I support is what the women uh, tell us they want. We've done surveys in Ghana and Kenya and Sierra Leone and several other countries and we've asked them to rank order their health needs. We've said what's more important to you, modern methods of contraception or help with malaria? or help with HIV AIDS, or clean drinking water, or help with typhus, typhoid, yellow fever, the other diseases that are endemic in Africa. And you know what they tell us every time, Bob? They tell us that they need help with clean drinking water, malaria, typhus, and typhoid. They're getting that they help. rank, they they're rank, getting that help from they the rank States. And reproductive they're also getting, right thankfully to bottom. USCID, which you apparently oppose, I gather you oppose, international family planning assistance, which is voluntary family planning, which says to women, we will give you the modern methods of contraception that will realistically allow you to space your pregnancy and to determine how many children you should have. And that's, that's not the what they, human and that's not rights what they're asking approach. For. That's, that's not what they the want. That's the basic approach. That is an approach that is not only affirms what we all talked about. There should be no coercion when right. it comes to a woman's decision about when to have children. If she's raped, should she have access to an abortion? I know what your position is on that. I think I know what your position is on that. My position is that this is all a misallocation of resources. This is a billion dollars that could be spent ah, improving, so you are opposed to international family improving, planning assistance. improving primary health care because you know what population control programs do? Primary health care begins right with reproductive. When you provide women with access to family planning, allow them to space their children, two things happen. Child mortality declines rapidly. Maternal mortality declines rapidly. That's a good thing, isn't it? Okay. Of course it's a good thing. That, I, I understand that is your critically point. important. Now, let and me, what let I'm suggesting to you that contraceptives are, first of all, a human right imperative. That's number one. Number two, that it is extremely beneficial just from the woman's perspective, from the family's perspective. Because when women are able to space their pregnancies, not only are there better health outcomes instead of maternal mortality and child mortality, but we know that smaller families tend to be healthier families, that the children tend to be better educated, that in fact in country after country all around the world when birth rates have fallen as a result of contraception becoming available, not the China example, we see prosperity follows because what naturally happens is what economists and demographers call the demographic dividend. When parents have the ability to space 
their pregnancies, to determine how many children they're going to have, they have healthier, better educated, and more prosperous families. Okay, respond quickly. Let me, let respond me, quickly. Tell, you, let me Steve, tell you a better way. Respond quickly, then I'll, then I'll have to cut you off. Let, so let me tell you a better way. There is a better, way, a better than, way. There is a better way than coercive family planning programs, which I'm the not women supporting do not family want. Planning programs. Okay, there, whenever the government gets involved, there is an element of coercion. Well, when, a government, when a government official shows up at your door and says, "Here is your monthly supply of birth control pills," there is I think an element of coercion in that. Now, but, that, but my main point, my main point I'm is sorry. this: I, I if have you to go, disagree with you on your okay. characterization if of you our go, programs. If you go, I've been in the field. I've been with so these I. USAID so workers. I. I know what our programs look like. It's They're my not turn. the way you describe it's my turn. Um, so you go into a clinic in rural Africa. And you will find the clinic stacked at the ceiling with condoms, IUDs, Depo-Provera, and everything else. There may be no malarial tablets. There may be no uh, penicillin. There may be no antibiotics. But there are plenty. There are plenty. There is a surplus of, of the pills and potions and IUDs and so forth. And now, when if you, you go want into to the villages reduce, where there are no contraceptives, you're going to find much higher maternal mortality, no, no. Let much me, higher let me, child let me mortality. Let me tell you, my, my point is this. If you want to reduce the birth rate, you should do the same thing that the Germans did, the French did, that we Americans did, that the Japanese did, and so forth, right? You should reduce the infant and child mortality rate by providing primary health care. Because as the people in the few countries which still have high birth rates see more of their children surviving to adulthood, guess what? They have fewer children. I told Bill Gates this 10 years ago. I'm I said, all look, in Bill, favor follow of reducing the child better mortality. angels. Okay. And the but first step to reducing child mortality is to provide women with reproductive health care okay. no, the first so they can step, space their pregnancy. The first step That's is to make basic. sure the first step is to make sure that the children they have survive to adulthood. Because if their children survive to adulthood, I'm all in guess favor what? Of children they won't to have five or six children. They'll have two or three children. It's called the demographic transition. And it's happened every everywhere in the world and it will happen in sub-Saharan Africa it will happen in those other countries but we have to focus on primary health care. have access to okay let's, let's do this uh, that's a very great discussion by the so, way do I do I get to ask uh, Steve a question I think we've already passed that already because <laughs> I'd, I'd love to ask him a question let's have it? time constraints let's, let's do this right. but let's talk about what you agree with what the other person said is there anything there that we do all agree upon you can go first Bob <laughs> I'll be happy to go first. <laughs> I know, Steve, that you have a great concern about abortion. I'm sure that you, I don't think I'm mischaracterizing your position, would like to see the incidence of abortion reduced in the world today. It, is this something that you agree with me on? I would like to see the incidence of abortion reduced in the world today. Okay. And I think that the primary cause of abortion in the world today is an unwanted pregnancy. And that the most effective way to prevent an unwanted pregnancy is to spread the use of contraception by giving women more options, more contraceptive options, the options of their choice, and I mean voluntarily, completely free, whatever they think is best for their needs. Or and if they choose not to have any, that's fine as well. But by increasing access to contraception, I know you want to cut funding for U.S. support for contraception. I want to Put it but, into but a different area. I want to put it, spend it on primary health care to want save to lives you want to cut instead it. of taking lives. And, but let's go back to contraception. If, if you want to reduce abortion, why don't we make sure that every woman in the world has access to a modern method of contraception? Wouldn't that reduce the number of unwanted pregnancies? And wouldn't that dramatically, because the numbers are, I can go through all the numbers of this. There's, huge amount of evidence of this. Wouldn't, th wouldn't doing so dramatically reduce the number of abortions? Th this is something that we don't agree on. <laughs> we because, don't. I, because I, thought, you see, I thought we both wanted to reduce abortions. And that's where you started. That's not where you ended up. Um, I think so. Look, the, the, uh, the fact is there are lots of traditional societies which have managed to, to institute very low birth rates historically without the without abortion or infanticide? Without, without abortion, without infanticide. Look, in, in China, 300 years ago, before the advent of the modern contraceptives that, that you're so enamored of, which actually have deleterious health effects on women, um, 
the average Chinese family, uh, woman had five children over her reproductive lifetime. That was just about the number she wanted. I don't think they kept public health statistics back then. I've, we we I've, have I've, the best, the best I, look, I, I'm, I'm a sinologist and, and I've reviewed oh, the historical okay. record. Oh, all right. Okay, go ahead. I read, write, and speak Chinese. So you can, yeah. you can take that as you know, sure. a, a, an expert opinion, uh, not, just, not just a wild speculation. So yeah, it was about five children because they okay. were, there was, uh, there was, uh, uh, periodic abstinence within the marriage. Uh, there was universal breastfeeding, and so births were spaced naturally uh, without resorting to powerful steroid-based drugs. Uh, there are problems with going to African back, women. Uh, back in that period, 300 years ago, were, were, were there any abortions? Was there an infanticide at that time? Uh, in China, in poor areas in China. of China, yes, there was not there, there was, was infanticide. Oh. Now, so unwanted now let's, pregnancies, let's, even um, three hundred years ago. But, let's, but let's go. Let's let's go on to your preferred solution: is to hand, put all women on powerful steroid-based drugs. Now we I we have a that. problem. No, no, wait, wait, yeah. but I said that women should powerful. have access to the contraceptive method of their choice. It might be it might be a condom. It yeah, might but be, that's not. It might be but a pill. It not, might be an IUD. That's not our program. You see, that's not our program because what right now, program? in order to measure the desire for contraceptives, we go and ask women two questions. This is according to the USAID surveys. The first question we ask is, have you had a baby in the last two years? Mm -hmm. And if the answer is, is, uh, is yes, then the second question is, are you using a modern method of contraception, which is to say a birth control pill or an IUD or Depo-Provera? If the answer is no, or then they are said to have an unmet need for contraception. Mm -hmm. Now, that is not you are not asking the woman, do you want to contracept? You're simply imposing your view of what she should want on her. I think that's demeaning to women. I think this is a form of cultural imperialism. Well, first I think of all, I, Africa, I, Sub-Saharan Africa, which is I, the big is target the policy of for population control programs. And it is my belief that Every woman should be able to make the decision about whether to use a contraceptive free from any coercion, whether it's from the government or from her husband, or from her religious leader, Wh which is not the way it's work. Which is not the way the program works. Well, you know that there are targets and quotas in these programs. You oh, know that government and official, yeah, government Where are officials. These targets and quotas. Targets. Are you telling me that USAID today has targets and yes, quotas as to how many women yes, will have Yes, it does. It has. It does projections, and based on those projections, projections it sends are both loads than quotas, I think. of boatloads of contraceptives to countries where it puts tremendous pressure on ministries of health to meet those targets lest the funding be cut off. Oh, okay. so you're okay, saying let's do that, this. Let's do this. I want to go back to this point because I think this is a critical point. Yes. I'm really disturbed by the fact that you think that USAID today is going around the world telling governments that if they don't <clears> accept <throat> international if family planning systems, reach that we're going to cut off all other funding. Prevalence First rate, of all, they that will decision, lose funding. anybody who says that, any USAID official who goes and tells them that we're going to cut off all other forms of assistance is purely lying. Because Congress, in many cases, has said we are <sighs> going to give this country this amount of, of assistance. It's not conditioned on whether or not the government accepts international Abs funding. It, it, that, it is absolutely, myth, it is absolutely is conditioned. No, no. Yes, I can, it is a myth. I have written a book on this. I'll give you a copy, Bob. It's called I'll be Population happy to look at Control. The copy. And it has but a whole I've, chapter on I've how been in the field we and I know use what foreign USAID aid is telling to people. force these programs on countries that don't want them and to force governments into the business of forcing these things on women who don't want them. No. We're okay, not forcing okay. contraceptives on women who don't want them. We are giving them options. There's a difference. Well, All right, we'd like to think so, but that's not the way it works on the ground, unfortunately. Gentlemen, please. At this point in time, it's clearly, clearly, we should agree to disagree and have I a think part two. I think we can two. do that, yes. Yeah. Respectfully. At this present time, what I'd like to do is get a few questions from our viewers, if that's sure. okay. Zachary Wright says, or he asks rather, how exactly do you define the word overpopulation? Bob? The question is uh, one of what is the Earth capable of sustaining in terms of human population and for how long? Right now, we have 7.2 billion people on the planet, and you indicated we're doing pretty well. Health outcomes, many other outcomes, we're doing very well. Very well. And the question is, however, how long can we continue? Because what happens with overpopulation, I want to go back, this goes back to the question you raised earlier. 
you say, well, everything's going fine. Everything's going great. So why are we talking about overpopulation? What you described is really sort of the classic, what I call the bubble. In, in every bubble, whether it's an economic bubble, an environmental bubble, or whatever else, people get carried away and say, yeah, we're doing great. We're doing fabulous. All these naysayers have been proved wrong. They're never going to be right. The naysayers are never going to be right. Well, you've been wrong for 50 years. I mean, how much more time do you need? Well, I think we just talked about it earlier today. The fact is that we do see the warning signs. We see the warning signs in water scarcity. We see it in food security. We see it in environmental degradation. We see it in climate change. We see it in the extinction of plant and animal species. These are all warning signs that we are not living sustainably. And when we don't live sustainably, something ultimately has to give. And that giving might be in the early stages, it might just mean the extermination of other plant and animal species. But ultimately what's at stake here when we talk about overpopulation is the survival of the human species itself. Because if we are eroding away the Earth's ecosystems that support not just other forms of life, but human life as well, we are endangering future generations. I can't say how long we can keep up at 7.2 billion. I'm sure we can keep up at 7.2 billion for a while, maybe 10, 15, 20 years, but at an extraordinarily cost to the environment and to future generations. I don't think we're living sustainably. I think we are living far beyond our means at this point, and that we have to do, and it's not just a question of reducing human numbers. I'll go with that. I think we also have to take a look at human consumption patterns. I think we have to, to reduce waste in food production. I think we have to reduce waste in the consumption of food. I think there are lots of the different things we do. We, yeah, we need to protect the whales. But my point is, is that we are in a position now that unless we reduce human numbers through a human rights-based approach, which says that every woman should be able to decide freely how many children and when, unless we take that approach, I think we're headed into a day of reckoning. Okay. Now, can I answer the question that, that Bob didn't answer? Sure. The question right. was, the question was, it? you didn't. The question was, define overpopulation. And you know as well as I that the demographers have no definition of overpopulation. There so can never exist. be, there can never be a definition of overpopulation because the number of people that the planet is capable of sustaining depends on the level of technology that you specify. And if we were back at the hunter-gatherer mm, stage, technology. it would be about two people per square mile in the temperate zone, going up with settled agriculture to several hundred, with irrigation to a thousand. But our technology shows no sign of tapering off. We continue to make technological advances, and each advance in technology means that the planet is, will be capable of sustaining more people rather than fewer. So you cannot ever say what, we have seen what with the, the advance number of will technology. be you cannot ever say what that, have say, 10 billion people is too many or 12 billion people. It all depends on the level of technology, and we keep making technological advances. Let me ask you about those technological advances. With all these technological advances, have we st stopped the deforestation? Have we stopped the yes, acidification we, we of the have oceans? Stopped, listen, have we, we have stopped, stopped? We have stopped the deforestation east uh, of the have. Mississippi River. We have. deforestation. Listen, okay, uh, let me answer your question. There, there is far more forest east of the Mississippi in the United States today than there was in 1900. I'm talking the globally, reason, Steve. The reason why... I'm talking about the world. Yes, but let me... I'm about to get to the world, but I've got ah. to start in the United States because what we've done is we've taken people out of farming and let the land revert to native forest, right? I have a farm in the Shenandoah Valley which is rapidly being overgrown by cedar trees it's, it, that's the first stage of reforestation because I can't, don't have the time to farm it. That is happening all over the eastern United States. The answer to deforestation is economic development. You know, the problem economic here, development. the problem here is poverty. You see the problem as people. I see the problem as poverty. It's the very poor that pollute the very water they need to drink because they can't afford to, to build water well, treatment plants. They can't all, afford to dig wells. It's the poor who cut down the last tree because they need it for fuel to heat their houses or to cook their food. It's the poor who devastate the environment. Once you get to about $3,000 per capita, you can correct the problems 
that were caused in the environment yeah. by your numbers. We see let's, that let's internationally. Take, you know, first of all, I believe that, that a huge part of the environmental problems in the world today are caused by rich, affluent societies. I'm not going to put the blame on poor people. But when you take a look at where poverty is greatest in the world today, if you were to do a list of the top 20 poorest countries in the world today, you would find out that their birth rates are also the highest in the world today. Because their infant because child mortality rates are high. Their children hand. are dying naturally. They go they have more. hand in hand. Oh. Poverty and hunger today go hand in hand with high fertility. And that unless women are able to space and plan their pregnancies to have fewer children but healthier children, better educated children, they will not escape poverty. And they will continue to go out and do the very things you talked about in terms of cutting down trees for their, for their, for their stoves and that type of that, thing. Before, before, before you move on, before you move on, it's it also related to population. All right, before we move on, let me do this. Let's take one more question from one, one of our viewers. This is from Ebony Watkins. She asked, what is the connection between population and economic, economic strength? Are more populous nations generally stronger than less populated ones? Steve. Well, clearly, I mean, one measure of, of, uh, of economic strength is, is the country's population. Uh, that has been understood since ancient times. Uh, you need a large population in order uh, to defend your country, for example, to mobilize an army. Uh, the larger your population, the greater the economies of scale uh, in economic terms. Uh, the easier it is for you to start up new enterprises and industries because you've got a domestic market there to consume the goods that are produced. So depopulation, which we're now seeing in Japan, we have had in Japan for the last 20 years a demographic recession caused by the fact that the Japanese birth rate has been below replacement since 1964. And currently the Japanese, I think the last numbers I looked at were they're averaging about 1.34 children. Uh, every Japanese woman over her reproductive lifetime. There are simply too few young Japanese coming into the workforce, starting buying homes, cars, starting new businesses, and Japan's economic future is being compromised as a result. So yes, people uh, do create economic power. One more, one more thing. The average baby born in the United States, if you crunch the numbers, will produce far more over his or her lifetime than they will consume. If you calculate the present future value of a baby born in the United States, uh, taking into account the cost of raising that child, feeding and clothing that child, and then taking into account the 50 years that they will be in the workforce. Uh, they will produce several hundred thousand more dollars worth of goods and services than they will consume. They will, in other words, leave the world a better place. So that is also true in China, where Steve, every Steve, baby, Steve, if you crunch Steve. the numbers, let's, will let's contribute go back to the basics more. Here to the GDP Let's than they will the consume. Basics. So so the 400 live, million missing Chinese are we, making China poor. We live uh, on a finite planet with finite resources. With a larger population, the per capita amount of resources available to individuals goes down. How can you say that? Well, You don't know what the resources of the future are. Are we running out of sand on the beach? Oh, of course no. not. Silicon chips, right? Yeah. They, they take silica. Is there any shortage of silica? Who would have thought that we would have taken useless about sand, sand on shortage. the beach and made Thank it into for that, modern but I'm not means worried of about communication? Sand shortage. No, Steve. but that's just an example. Well, I know, but it's a bad example. It's a good example. No, it's a bad it's example, a, Steve. Excellent example. The fact of the matter is, is that we do live in a finite planet. And let me go back to several of the points you raised here. The first point is, is that the true measure of economic prosperity in any country is not GDP. The true measure is getting closer with per capita GDP. Now, you say that Japan is an economic basket case, right? It, no, I said it was in demographic a demographic disaster. recession for the last 20 years. Yes. Well, first of all, most economists would say that, that was a result of bad economic management on the part of the Japanese. But let's leave that aside for a moment, because despite the bad economic management that's happened in Japan for the last 20 years, we've seen that Japan's doing actually pretty well. How about the unemployment rates in Japan? Are they better or worse than we have? Japan has a shortage of workers because of the low birth rate. Japan has a yes. low unemployment rate. Yes. And what about per capita GDP? How has Japan been doing in per capita GDP compared to a lot of the other countries in the world? Pretty good, actually, despite a fairly tepid economy, because I know population is stabilizing Japan, is beginning to decline. But your focus on the larger GDP, 
I'm sorry, prosperity is measured on a per capita basis. Now, the next thing that really troubled me about your remarks is you say, well, all right, children born in the United States are going to produce more than they consume. Let's look at that argument. Right now, the United States population is about 5% of the world. We consume about 20% of the world's resources. We account for about 20% of the carbon emissions in the world. We consume about 20% of the energy. We consume about 20% of the, of the metals and minerals. That's not production. That's consumption. We produce 20% of the world's research, GDP, and we no, consume it. Oh, wait a We're second. producing what we consume. Different we are not GDP exploiting the rest of the world's productive than factors. resources. And my point is this is that in a finite world, and we do live in a finite world, we do have to be concerned, not about sand, but we have to be concerned about water, we have to be concerned about topsoil, we have to be concerned about forests, we have to be concerned about the amount of metals and minerals that remain in the ground and which will hopefully will be available for future generations. Those are finite, relatively finite resources. And the question is, is are we exhausting those at a pace that will imperil the prosperity of future generations? And I think the answer to that is obvious. Yes, we are. Take a look at what's happened. I think the answer is obviously no. I think take there a look are plenty at what's of resources to commodity prices. that we when you can take find. a look at the prices of metals, the price of metals since 2000, metals overall as a category, has gone up 176 percent in the last 13 years. The prices have gone up 176 percent. That is a sign of increasing scarcity. What's happened around the world is that we've exhausted all of the easy places to find our metals and minerals. We're now having to go down into the ocean seabeds to do that. Well, okay, that's an advance of technology, but it's also a warning sign because what we are doing is we're getting more and more desperate as to where we go to get our oil. We're going to go into the Arctic Ocean to drill way down in the Arctic Ocean to get our oil because we are desperate for oil. And if we have more population and more economic growth, that desperation is going to grow. All right, we're going to have to end it there. I want to thank our guests, Steve Mosier and Bob Walker, for a robust debate. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for watching The Scholar's Mate. We'll see you next time.